so, so first of all, thank you very much. Uh, uh, this evening, as we celebrate one of the greatest Africans of the 20th century and whose ideas continue to remain relevant, we are, in my view, engaged in this, this exercise because we recognize that the ideas of the Osagia for Kwame Nukuruma remain relevant today as they were during his lifetime. Many of you will have had the advantage of reading about the Osagia for Kwame Nukuruma. You may have heard and listened to some of the speeches that he made during his lifetime. You may have recognized that he was one of the very early Africans who in the days of Pan-Africanism was present in Manchester in 1945. And he was in many ways one of the greatest Africans ever to have carried the mantle of the struggle for independence in an Africa that had been laboring under the weight of neo-colonialism and subsequently colonial colonialism. You may also know that the Osage for Kwame Nkrumah was one of the very few Africans in those very early days who was able to confront the imperialists and the colonialists and to awaken the spirit of freedom amongst his contemporaries. In fact, several polls that have been held in the recent past have had the Osage for being recognized as perhaps the greatest African politician who ever lived in the 20th century. And what is amazing about him are uh, that his ideas were as prophetic as they were relevant. You only have to read some of his writings, and some of you have had the occasion to read his writings, such as, I speak of freedom. And in that great treatise, the Osage for from 1950s, begins to talk passionately and consistently, not only about the freedom of Ghana, which was then known as the Gold Coast, but constantly reminding his audience that the freedom of Ghana would be of no significance if the rest of Africa was not free. You will remember on the day that Ghana regained our independence on the 6th day of March 1957, the Osage was as passionate as he was eloquent in reminding Ghanaians to celebrate their freedom, in reminding them that they were celebrating an important occasion, but also reminding them that the independence of Gold Coast, then renamed Ghana, would mean nothing if the rest of Africa was not free. You will remember subsequent to the independence of Ghana, in 1957, in 1958, the Osage and his administration convened a meeting in Accra, Ghana, at which meeting he reminded not only the political class that was present there, but the trade unionists who assembled that the most urgent business. And he made that statement and he made it several times. He then posed the question, not rhetorically, of course, some say rhetorically, but it does not matter. When he asked, when we say, seek ye first the political kingdom and the rest will be given unto you. What are these other things that will be given unto you? And he then went on a journey of explaining to his audience, the things that will be given unto you are the dividends of economic emancipation. We are going to talk about economic emancipation because freedom of the political kind in and of itself is not an end. We are going to talk about how to eradicate poverty. We are going to talk about how to feed ourselves. 
We are going to talk about how to harness our resources. And this specifically mentioned, we are going to ensure that our coffee farmers get their fair share of what they deserve. We are going to make sure that our gold does not benefit foreigners, but is going to be beneficial to the people of, of Ghana. We are going to ensure that we build infrastructure and road for us, roads for ourselves. We are going to ensure that we have electricity. We are going to industrialize Ghana. And he reminded his audience that the Ghanaians had a great duty, the duty to demonstrate to those who are in the business of doubting that Africans cannot manage their affairs, that indeed Africa could, and he was as consistent as he was passionate. But perhaps one of the greatest things that the Osage of Kwame Nkrumah did and said that will remain indelibly marked in the sands of time is the speech that he made on the 25th day of May, 1963. That was the occasion when the 32 heads of states and government of the then independent African countries at the invitation of Ethiopia's Hail Selassie assembled in Addis Ababa. And at that time, many of you will remember that the imperialist whom the Osage for had rightly said does not change his character but only wears different masks had already started to animate their diabolical scheme of dividing the continent of Africa along what some described ideological lines but in my view they were simply a bunch of progressive of, of retrogressive uh, counter-revolutionaries and progressive African leaders. You'll remember that that division was christened the Monrovia Group, the Monrovia Group that was led by Tapman of Liberia and included, among others, Felix Soufé Boigny of La Côte d'Ivoire, who had been persuaded effectively, particularly by the French government administration of Charles de Gaulle, that Africa should not unite. And the more progressive group which comprised the Osagie for Kwame Nkrumah, Ahmed Ben Bella of Algeria, Mudibo Keita of then the Sudan, now Mali, and a little later people such as Julius Kambarage Nyerere of Tanzania and Kenneth David Kaunda, known as the Casablanca Group. And they were clear on that day in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, the Osage for was riding on the crest of what he had said times without number. He had said on a number of occasions that the situation in Africa is heartening and encouraging, but also disturbing. Heartening and encouraging because 32 African countries which had labored under the yoke of the colonialists were now politically independent but disturbing because the erstwhile colonizer was already using some within the ranks of Africans to divide the continent. The Osage had reminded the continent that African peoples may have diverse cultures and different languages, but their diversity was going to be the glue that was going to make unity a reality. He had reminded his audience times without number that indeed, African countries that have been created in Berlin in 1884 and 1885 were unviable. They were too small. And if they persisted in their disunity, then they will be manipulated by the erstwhile colonizer. The Osagiefo was as clear as he was prophetic. He himself said that he was already doing the work of prophets without the gift of prophecy. But he had the ability, now history demonstrates to us, to take the pulse of the continent and to read it correctly. So that when he spoke on that day, on the 25th day of May, 1963, he was not the only speaker, there were others. And I can remember, except from a few of the leaders, I can remember Hail Selassie of Ethiopia reminding his audience that it was a momentous occasion that Africans were present in Addis Ababa, 
I can remember David Dako of Central African Republic saying that he himself and his people are happy that they were now under a new administration which was led by the people of Central African Republic. I can remember Julius Kambaraga Nyerere reminding his audience that they did not come to Addis Ababa to underline how important unity was because unity was a condition sine qua non but that they were coming there to cement unity. I can remember many of them saying great things which are now recorded in history. But indeed, many have spoken, the 31 of them spoke, but the standout speech on that day was that of Osage for Kwame Nukuruma. He was as passionate as he was direct. He was as direct as he was right. He was as right as he was prophetic. He was as prophetic as he was realistic. And he told his audience, we are gathered here because we are independent. I'm paraphrasing the Osagiev. We are gathered here. Let us be in the knowledge that the independence that we have regained was not given to us on a silver platter. The imperialist does not give anything for free. He does so willy-nilly. The Africans fought and sacrificed. That is why we are here today. We are here today because our people fought and sacrificed and recognized that the long-term health of the black man not only demanded but required that we must be masters of our own affairs, that we prefer poverty in freedom rather than tranquility in servitude, the Osagifo said. But he told them to remember that the neo-colonial project may have been terminated, but there was another project which was being manufactured in earnest, the neo-colonial project. And he said that the neo-colonial project was as pernicious, if not more pernicious than the colonial project. He therefore told his audience, the only way in which we can immunize ourselves from the diabolical machinations of these shape-shifting neo-colonialists and imperialists is to unite. I hear the Osage for telling his audience, let us not leave Addis Ababa without forming a common government. Let us not leave Addis Ababa without agreeing that we are going to have one army. Let us not leave Addis Ababa without recognizing that we need one currency. Let us not leave Addis Ababa without recognizing and ensuring that we are going to have free trade. Let us not leave Addis Ababa without choosing where our capital is. And the Osagiefo went on to hazard. He went on to say, if I was asked, Bangui in Central African Republic would be the capital of that new thing called Africa. And if not Bangui, Leopoldville, now known as Kinshasa, but he then said, my word is not final. My colleagues and the people of Africa will determine that. And he told them, let us not leave here, therefore, without having our foreign ministers convening a meeting at which they'll discuss all issues and report back to us. But they listened not to the Osagie foe. They listened not to him. And what we ended up with was a success from them for, for the Monrovia group. We ended up with a watered down organization known as the Organization of African Unity. The story of the Organization of African Unity is known. We are not saying that it did not achieve certain things. I remember there are certain things that were done under the aegis of the Organization of African Unity, such as the struggle against the Smith regime in what is now Zimbabwe, or the struggle against the apartheid regime in South Africa, or the struggle against the apartheid regime in what was then known as Southwest Africa, now known as Namibia. I can still see them working in the struggle against the Portuguese in Guinea-Bissau, in Mozambique and in Angola, but to a large extent, the OAU, as some have described, was nothing but a toothless bulldog. Or if it had teeth, the teeth were not sharp enough to liberate Africa from her economic woes. And if anybody doubted the Osagie for Kwame Nukuruma, 
No sooner had the dust settled in the gains that we had made via decolonization, and even earlier, we started seeing the dirty hand of the neocolonialists. How many of you present here will forget the murderous regime of the Belgians who took out Congo's Patrice Emery Lumumba? How many of you here will forget how the French took out Togo's Silvanus Olympio? How many of you will remember how they manufactured coup d'etats? How many of you will forget how the Osagie for himself in 1966 was removed from power? How many of you will forget how Nigeria's Anamdia Zikiwe was removed from power and how Tafawa Balewa, the then prime minister, was liquidated and the sword honor of Sokoto Sahamadu Bell? How many of you will remember how they treated Algeria's Ahmed Ben Bella? And one can go on and on how the coups then became the way of neutralizing the gain that we had made. So the Osagie was right. And we went and are still going through a difficult phase, a phase that vindicates the Osagie So vindicated was the Osagie that in the year 2000, the African nations started re-examining the efficacy of the organization of African unity and they agreed that they needed go back to go back to what the Osage had said. I remember so very vividly during the chairmanship of South Africa's Nkosaza and Adlamini Zuma, when he be, she became the chair, she wrote an imaginary letter to Kwame Nkuruma, telling Kwame Nkuruma, we are apologize to you, Kwame Nkrumah. You told us to do certain things in a certain way, but we forgot. But now that we have had the scales removed from our eyes, we shall retrace our steps. We shall not persist in our foolishness. We shall correct our mistakes and do what you prescribed to us 50 years before. And that is how the African Union came into being before she was appointed. And that is how we now have the African Union and Africa Agenda 2063 saying the very same thing that the Osage had said. If you look at the Africa Agenda 2063 and listen to the speech of the Osage for Kwame Nukuruma, it is a rehash of the same. If you look at earlier initiatives such as the Lagos Plan of Action of 1980, it is the same thing that the Osage had said. If you look at the Lomé Agreement of 1975, it is the same thing that the Osage had said. If you look at the 2000 Cotonou Agreement, it is the same thing that the Osage had said. If you look at the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, we started operating in Accra, Ghana on the first day of January this year, 2021. It is the same thing that the Osage for had said. If one were to be romantic and melodramatic at once, the Osage for was ahead of his time. But it is not our duty, it does no good to the Osage for and others to lament and to remain in lamentation. The most important thing and the greatest homage that we can pay to the Osage for Kwame Nukuruma is to give meaning to his words and to his works. And I now wonder to myself, if the Osage for is up there, he looks at Africa and looks at her as she is now. And he remembers how in 1963 he had prescribed what he thought was an antidote to our problems. What would the Osage for see? The Osage for would see an Africa that is as disturbing and heartening as he said in 1957. It is disturbing because if the Osage for looks down from yonder, he sees an Africa which has reneged on her promises. An Africa that promised her sons and daughters that she would eliminate poverty and poverty is still rampant. An Africa that promised her sons and daughters that she would eliminate ignorance and ignorance 
is common in the continent. An Africa that promised her sons and daughters that she would bring peace and tranquility is at war. This is what the Osagiefo would see. The Osagiefo would see that there is a conflict in South Sudan and the Osagiefo would lament. The Osagiefo would see that there is conflict in the Nuba Mountains and the Blue Nile and in Dafu in the Sudan. The Osagiefo would see that there is conflict in Tigray in Ethiopia the very place, the very home of the country where he delivered his 1963 speech. The Osagiefo would look at Somalia and he would see that the Somalia is divided and it needs peace. The Osagiefo would look at Mozambique and he would see that there is an insurgency in northern Mozambique. The Osagiefo would also not stop there. The Osagiefo would go to eastern Congo and see how the home of Patrice Emery Lumumba has never known peace since Patrice Emery was eliminated. The Osagiefo would go to Central African Republic and he would recognize that there is no peace there, the home of David Dako. He would go a little up there and see Burkina Faso, the home of Thomas Ankara, and he would see that there is no peace there. He would go to Niger. He would go to Mali, he would go to Mauritania and he would see there is no peace there. He would go to the Cameroons and he would lament about the plight of the Amazonians. He would go to Nigeria and recognize that Boko Haram have now made kidnapping a spot. He would go and remember that even before that there were civil wars in Sierra Leone, in Liberia. He would remember that Libya is not at ease, Nigeria, Niger, Algeria is not at ease. He would remember that even Tunisia is not at ease. He will remember that at one time there was a genocide in Rwanda. He would remember that even Burundi is just struggling. He would look at Kenya and see how tribalism, which he condemned, is the only way in which the Kenyan politician knows how to manipulate and to organize our politics. The Osagiefo would be saddened, but he would not allow the pathos of the moment to drown his enthusiasm. He would tell Africa once again that it's not too late. He would tell us, we who are assembled here this evening, the mantle is yours. Wake up and do what is right. Go into the corners of Africa and shout from the rooftops, even if you cannot be heard at your most eloquent. Go to Cape Town and tell them that Africa must unite. Tell the South Africans that there is no time for xenophobia. You will, you will tell us to go to South Africa. We'll go to Egypt, you'll tell us, go to Cairo, the home of Gamal Abdel Nasser, and tell us that we need to unite. He will tell us to go to Dakar. He will tell us to go to Djibouti and Addis Ababa and Bangui and Leo Kinshasa and all other capitals and remind us, I told you, seek ye first the political kingdom and the rest shall be given unto you. But those other things have not come. In fact, the Osagif would say, even the political freedom is disappearing by the day. So we who are here, we who are celebrating the Osagie for Kwame Nukurum, what justice can we do to his memory? What we must do is to leave and seek to do what he instructed us to do. Let us do what is good and right. Let us speak from the inner recesses of our minds and hearts and remind the fifth columnist amongst our ranks, remind the African political class who have become kleptocrats that the time is now. The time is now to give meaning to the speech of the Osagie of Kwame Nukuruma in 1963. The time is now to give meaning to the ideas which were rehashed, but which he had articulated. The time is now to make Africa Agenda 2063 real. The time is now to make the Yamasukuru protocol true so that Africans can fly. The time is now to make the Kigali protocol true so that Africans can travel without visas. The time is now to have one currency so that the Ghanaian traveling from Accra, Ghana to Somalia will have one currency to deal with. The time is now. The time is now 
to use the ideas of the Osage for Kwame Nkrumah to unite and claim the dividends of the fourth industrial revolution. The time is now. The choice is yours and mine. We can continue to romanticize the ideas of the Osage for without giving them practical meaning, or we can choose to give them meaning by giving them life, by giving them the oxygen of reality. So let us all unite. Unite in the knowledge that if we are disunited, we shall be conquered. Unite in the knowledge that if we do not do what is good and right, we will be conquered again. Unite in the knowledge that Africa can't be great, but she can only be great in our unity. Unite in the knowledge that if we want to shake this big tree called neocolonialism, we must remain strong and united because if we don't, as the Igbo rightly say, he who is weak and wants to shake the giant Iroko tree will only end up shaking his buttocks. Let us not shake our buttocks. Let us combine and give meaning to the great man of, 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 of Ghana, the great man of Africa, the Osage for Kwame Nkrumah. That is why we say Nkrumah is dead, but Nkrumah never dies. Not because his mortal remains are not, are not interred in Nkrofu, but because his ideas are alive for every generation to give meaning. Thank you very much. That is a, a question that, of course, uh, needs a longer period to answer. But just very briefly, one of the things that we must recognize is that throughout history, and there is evidence, as you will note, from Europe, from the United States of America, that will answer your question, that unity is not for the faint-hearted. And sometimes when we talk about unity, we are understood to be very simplistic. We are not being simplistic about this. We are not saying that one day all the countries will go to a suburb and then they say, we are now united. We are saying that unity is a process. It is constructive. And that is why when you look at some of the things that you now see under the Africa Agenda 2063 or the Africa Continental Free Trade Area that my brother was beginning to talk about, these are steps that are geared towards leading to a process that will ensure that the barriers that stand in our way will no longer exist and effectively we will be reading from the same page. If you look at the history, for example, of the East African Community One before it was dissolved in 1977, these were movements towards unity of some kind. If you look at what uh, the reasons behind the creation of ECOWAS or SADAC or, 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 or the Maghreb, and under the auspices of the African Union, if we look at some of the things that have happened in the recent past, I've already mentioned the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, which deals with the removal of tariff and non-tariff barriers. I mentioned the Yamasuku Protocol that talks about the air, the free uh, flights in the air spaces of Africa. I talked about the, uh, the, uh, the Kigali Protocol that talks about free movement of persons and a single passport. And I'm talking about, I haven't talked about the Maputo protocol or all those other protocols. All these are designed to move us in that direction. But don't think that the rest of the world wants Africa to unite. You have seen a very resurgent France that is trying to do everything within its powers, even if it denies, to ensure that Africa does not unite. See a resurgent United Kingdom post-Brexit that is doing everything within her power to ensure that Africa is divided. You are seeing a resurgent Russia that is trying to ensure that she has a military presence in Africa, a resurgent Turkey, and even more resurgent China, India. These are battles that we are going to have to fight, and we are going to have to fight them by understanding our enemy, and I'm using the word enemy loosely, but our competitors, if you want to be a little bit more charitable to them. And, and the danger is that sometimes, particularly now we in Africa, we paralyze ourselves through too much analysis. And once again, even the tools of analysis that we use are not Afrocentric. 
There are tools that are handed down to us by, by, by other thinkers. There is, there is no harm in understanding what Marx said. There is no harm in understanding what those English and American scholars say. But there is wisdom in using that knowledge for coming out with an ideas that are Afrocentric and therefore sensitive to the realities of our continent. It is not for the faint-hearted. There will be many people who will tell you it cannot be done. But history has demonstrated that the most difficult of things can be achieved by men and women who are focused and men and women who know that these battles are intergenerational and one generation passes over the baton to another. I believe that that is what I can say. But as I said at the beginning of answering the question, this would constitute a subject for a whole semester in your political science class. <clears throat> Thank the professor. Uh, I've spoken to him before, and I was uh, really uh, glad to have uh, spoken to him personally. I feel like a uh, uh, professor is the one who has sparked the, this uh, desire and uh, this interest in Pan-Africanism, and he has been a voice. I feel like he's a voice of, uh, like in the Bible, they say, John, who's preparing the way for the coming of the Messiah. So mm -hmm. first First of all, I want to appreciate him uh, for that. Uh, there's a couple of papers which I wrote and uh, he was able to, to read them through. And uh, <clears throat> I, I appreciate him for that. What I wanted to ask is that if you look at uh, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, he warned about these groups, the different groups uh, which form in the different parts of the continent, the regional groups like ESC, ECOWAS, SADIC, all these groups, because the groups have been used uh, by, by the imperialists to penetrate and find out what Africa is doing and take advantage of it. Example is the Africa continental free trade area today. Uh, the Africa continental free trade area, yesterday I saw uh, a message which was going around and France is trying to organize countries like uh, Ghana, um, uh, South Africa, Nigeria, I think with Kenya also. And uh, when you look at these, these are English speaking countries and France is trying to organize an electronic sort of electronic, to create an electronic platform. So how do we <clears throat> give support to such an enterprise that has already been penetrated by the neo-colonialists themselves to take advantage of it? Uh, an example also, another example also is uh, when you look at Ghana where the secretariat is, you see that all the other manufacturing companies have, have run to Ghana because they have seen that there's, there's a, the secretariat is there. Countries like Toyota, Nissan, uh, VW, they have all put up assembling plants there in, in Ghana to try to uh, look as if these these uh, look as if the, as if these companies or these cars which are manufactured there, which are assembled there actually, not manufactured there, they are manufactured in Ghana so that they can take advantage of the rest of the African continent. How are we going to deal uh, with this scenario? We look at Ghana, there is already a manufacturing company called Kantanka, but now it is being stifled. It's being stifled instead of being helped. When you go to Nigeria, we have Innocent, also is a manufacturing car, a car manufacturing company, but it is being stifled. So how are we going to deal with this problem? Thank and you how very are we much. Thank, thank you, you very, very much for that question. Thank, thank you very much. In fact, you've asked, asked the question that is very important because when my good brother had started talking about the Africa continental free trade area, he talked about the skeptics. And I've been following the FTCA quite keenly. And what is amazing, most of the people who are writing about Africa continental free trade area are not Africans. Mm. And what then is happening is that they are creating the exact scenarios that you are talking about. For example, when you are going to talk about the removal of tariff and non-tariff barriers, and we are going to deal with the rules of origin. An item that is assembled in, 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 in Ghana is going to be deemed to be a Ghanaian product, while the only thing that has happened in Ghana is that it has been assembled, and it is essentially a Chinese product. And I think it is important that we are awake to these realities. You can now see there is a scramble for Africa. 
You see, the Europeans are summoning African leaders. If they don't see, do so in Berlin, they invite them to Russia, they invite them to buy Beijing, they invite them to London, they invite them to Washington, they invite them to Beijing. Unfortunately, and, and, and I feel very sad when I say this. It appears that our political leaders are so susceptible to manipulation that they are incapable of seeing some of these schemes. When Americans come up with a goal, their goal is not designed to help Africa. When the Americans is talking about preferred trade, it is not meant to, to, to benefit the Africans. You'll have the crumbs. You'll have a few export processing zones done in your country and you think that you are created. You'll rebase your economy and you think you are doing well, but poverty persists. And that is why it reminds me of a speech that was delivered by Julius Nyerere on the sixth day of March, 1997 in Accra, Ghana, on the occasion of the independence of, uh, of, of, of Ghana. And the title of the speech, Without Unity, There Is No Future for Africa. And Nyerere, who was one of the people who had talked about gradual unity of Africa said, Nkrumah was right, we were wrong. Nkrumah was right because now that we have created these regions, East African community, ECOWAS, and all these, SADAC and others, people are becoming a little bit parochial, and their parochialism is standing in the way of African unity. I now hope that as we move towards Africa continental free trade area, as we give meaning to Africa Agenda 2063, and as we recognize that the erstwhile colonizers, the European powers, the Russians and the Americans are working very hard to ensure that we are disunited and that we are reading from their script, we've got to think very differently. Somebody I see is raising the question, are they about sustainable development goals? You remember we had millennium development goals, then they brought, so we are always reading to a script that is not written in Africa. In a nutshell, Kwame, I can't agree with you more. You are right, and it is your generation. It is our generation, your generation, that must now begin to bring these things to the fore. What our university is doing when all these articles are being written? What are our governments doing in terms of research and development financing universities? If we don't do this, the Chinese are going to take over. The French are going to take over. Ask yourself, why should we have something called the Commonwealth? For whose benefit? If it is a, is a body of equal partners, why is the British monarch the head of it? Why do we have an organization called former French-speaking countries? Why? Why do we have an organization called former Portuguese countries? Why? If we have the African Union, why can't we do our things under the African Union and then we meet the rest of the world from the standpoint of the African Union? And this requires a people who are going to speak and to act. And perhaps this is where we are weak at. We have said, sometimes I think we have said enough and that there is time for action. How that action is going to be implemented is what I, I am grappling with. And if anybody has ideas, that is the point at which we should now meet. How are we going to work at it so that we begin to harass governments in a creative manner so that they can begin to move in the right direction? Let the Osage for the idea leave. Let us be warriors for what he preached. God bless you and have a good evening.